On my first playthrough of Elden Ring, nothing captured my attention more than the Godskin Apostles. Terrifying bringers of death adorned in grim robes of flesh, whose very purpose is audacious yet captivating, to bring death to the gods. The weight of the Godskin threat is punctuated by the power of their leader, the Glomide Queen, an Empyrean tied to the power of death and death and a direct challenge to Marka and her god kin. The Glomide Queen would channel the power of death and death, taking the form of the Black Flame, and beneath her she would raise up a creed of terrifying apostles who would wield this flame in her name, wearing the tanned skin of their enemies, enacting a terrifying god hunt. Yet ultimately Marika would have victory, given to her by her shadowbound beast, and the Glomide Queen's legacy would be hammered into the timeline. Yet for an event of such cataclysmic proportions, we know very little about the details. Who was the Glomide Queen? What actually are the Godskin Apostles? And when did it happen? These are questions I will seek greater clarity on in this lore video, and so I ask you to join me this week as we explore the lore of the mysterious Glomide Queen and her Godskin Apostles. At this stage, I would also like to offer my thanks to Eugenia Liza, an incredible artist and content creator, who was commissioned to do 3D renders of theoretical locations and characters from the Godskin movement. And so please check out their content, which I will link below. And remember guys, if you like Elden Ring lore, then consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. I think a good starting point for this subject is talking about the Glomide Queen and her nature, specifically the fact that she is an Empyrean, and let's discuss what it means to be Empyrean. I'd like to start with the item description of the Black Flame Ritual, which reads, The Glomide Queen led the Apostles. It is said that she was an Empyrean, chosen by the Fingers. For me, this is one of the most important pieces of lore when we're talking about the Glomide Queen. And so we know the Glomide Queen was an Empyrean, a state of being that is best described by Rani, who says the following about Empyrean status. I was once an Empyrean of the demigods. Only I, Mikola, and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika, to become the new god of the coming age, which is when I received Blythe in the form of a vassal tailored for an Empyrean. So lots of information there, pertinent to the Glomide Queen. Firstly, there is something there that some people might miss, and that is Rani's omission of the Glomide Queen entirely. Only I, Mikola, and Melania could claim that title, meaning that this generation of Empyreans has clearly come about a significant time period after the Glomide Queen was active, and that's a point we will revisit in the next chapter when we look about placing this in the timeline. Returning to Empyrean status, Rani talks of how she and the twins were selected to be an Empyrean by their own two fingers. And so the Occam's Razor assumption to be made is that at some point the Glomide Queen was also selected by two fingers to be an Empyrean. When looking at the role of the two fingers, specifically ours at Round Table Hold, we can very much see that they are instruments of the greater will meant to guide us towards a single goal, to ascend the Elden Throne and usher in a new age. Fine work, brave tarnished. The greater will is pleased. You have earned the right to become Elden Lord. Now, seek the Erd Tree and an audience with Queen Marika to become Elden Lord and restore the Golden Order. And indeed, Rani says that she was chosen by two fingers and she was meant to usher in a new age. And so we can assume that anything chosen by the two fingers is done so at the behest of the greater will, as part of its plan to institute a new type of order. And Imperian's role in the coming of a new order is to be a candidate for godhood, taking Marika's place at the head of a new order. So the Glomide Queen was chosen to potentially be a god, a god whose order would no doubt be defined 
by the Rune of Death as the centerpiece of her power. This is where a crucial part of an understanding of the lore is required. That being that the Greater Will considers those for Godhood that generally represent something outside of the current order. For example, we learn from Gary that Melania was born with the Scarlet Rot inside of her and was an Imperian for a potential new order, an Order of Rot. Queen Marika and her King Consort Radigan were blessed with twin demigods, and Melania was one of them. She was born an Imperian carrying the Scarlet Rot. An Empyrean is no mere demigod. In the age of the Elden Ring and Queen Manica, the precious Empyrean was born, a new god, to forge a new order. And so likewise we can assume that the Glomide Queen was chosen by her two fingers to be a new god, to forge a new order of death. A video I often reference on this channel is Ratataskor's video on how the Greater Will does not care about the Golden Order in particular, that it just wants an order of some kind. In this video, Raditasker talks on the relevance of Placidusax being named as Elden Lord, which of course suggests that at one stage there was a different Elden Lord, a different god, which ruled over a different order, defined by a differently configured Elden Ring perhaps the very Elden Ring illustrated in Fire Missoula, a far more wild and primal looking Elden Ring than the more refined and cut down version we see in the Age of the Golden Order. I discuss the ramifications of this idea in my Outer Gods lore video which I will link below, but in short, Melania's remembrance makes it clear that she was born with her afflictions, and yet she was still selected as an Imperian a potential replacement for Marika. Gary talks about the Order of Rot, and so it makes it clear that the Greater Will considered a new Order of Rot led by Melania as the replacement for Marika's Order. And while the Scarlet Rot may seem horrific to us, to the Greater Will it is just another form of Order, and indeed Gary lays out the principles of this suggested Order of Rot. Since Melania fought Radan, and the great scarlet flower blossomed in Aeonia. I have dedicated myself to her, and to the resplendence of the Order of Rot, the cycle of decay and rebirth." When considering the notion of unusual orders that are seen as acceptable by the Greater Will, we could look at two very different characters, two tarnished, the Dung Eater and Gold Mask. Both of these characters have iconic bits of gear, Goldmask's mask and Dung Eater's sun medallion. Both of the item descriptions for each have very similar language, and in essence, both of them describe how their sun designs they both carry are visual representations of a guiding force and the vision of a ring, their mending runes, that await them at the end of their journey. This suggests that both of these extremely diverse characters were directed and guided towards such a goal. The Tarnished have been called back as part of the Greater Well's plans, so the Dung Eater and the Gold Mask have a role to play here. And if we think about the guidance that shone upon them both, this outer force that directed them to take the actions that they did, we have to assume that it was the Greater Well, and this therefore shows that Dung Eater is as equal a proposition to Goldmask when it comes to repairing the Elden Ring. Ultimately, they both produce a Mending Rune that will help repair the Elden Ring and thus play a role in bringing about a new order. And so no matter what you think about Dung Eater, and while we may think it's a horrendous fate for the world to be cursed in his ending, it shows that the Greater Well doesn't really care, as long as order is restored and the ring is repaired. And if you'd like a more in-depth look at both Dung Eater and Gold Mask, and the role they play in the Greater Will's plans, I do have a lore video on each of those. So with all of that said, it isn't really a surprise to learn that there was an Imperian, elected by the Greater Will and the Two Fingers, that was associated with Death and Death. The Glomide Queen was considered and elected by the Two Fingers 
to be the potential god of a new age to overthrow and replace Marka. It was part of the Greater Will's plan. Ultimately, the power behind the Glomide Queen is a rune of the Elden Ring, the Rune of Death, and this is why the Black Flame incantations require faith, much like Crucible and Erdtree incantations do as well. But if the Glomide Queen was meant to bring in a new epoch, we do have to ask the question of when this happened and what necessitated the need for a new Imperium. And so with that said, let us now discuss where, where the Glomide Queen and her godskins sit in the timeline. When it comes to a general placement of these events, we do have two pillars of lore that cap either end of its potential timeline. Firstly, we know it must have come after the War of the Giants and the sealing of the Flame of Ruin. This is because of the Black Monks, traitors to the Fire Monks, who began to wield the Black Flame, and we now see them operating alongside Godskins in various locations, suggesting that these traitors joined the Godskin movement. And of course, the order that they defected from, the Fire Monks, only was established upon the sealing of the Flame of Ruin, giving us some level of confidence that the Godskin apostasy happened after the War of the Giants. On the other end of the timeline, we know that the Godskin event must have happened before the Night of the Black Knives, as this was the event that would lead Malekith to seal the Rune of Death within his flesh, thus robbing the Black Flame of its power, as is told to us by the Scouring Black Flame. And of course, their true power, the Godsling power of the Black Flame, must have been active during this event. So a pretty wide net, but it does give us some framework to work within. Our understanding of the timeline has evolved much over the past year, since the game's release, to the point where we are starting to get an understanding of the ancient civilizations that came before the Golden Order. One of the vanguards of lore discussion is Tarnished Archaeologist, who has presented incredibly valuable theories regarding the history of the Lands Between. And if you haven't watched any of their content, then please check it out, because in this chapter we're going to be presenting a timeline theory that was developed by Tarnished Archaeologist, and so credit to them. We know that Marika was once in Parian herself, thanks to the description of Malekith's remembrance, before she ascended to Godhood. Marika now rules over the Age of the Earth Tree, the age symbolised by the Golden Tree, and now, currently, is anchored by the Golden Order. Yet Marika has seemingly ruled over at least two ages, this current age of the Golden Order, and a prior age known as the Age of Plenty. In the past, I had never put a hard border between these two ages, seeing the Age of Plenty more as a sub-era, the early portion of the Age of the Earth Tree. However, in Tarnished Archaeologist's video Creeds of the Earth Tree, they more heavily separate the division between the Age of Plenty and what comes after. Tarnished Archaeologist combines the lore of what we know of the Age of the Crucible and the Age of Plenty into one era called the Ancient Earth Tree Era, and he believes that this age was different from the one that came after, because in this time, the Earth Tree was an actual arboreal tree, a real tree. And by the way, the term Ancient Earth Tree is actually a canon one, as the term is used in the description of Blessing of the Earth Tree, Blessing's Boon, and Earth Tree Heal. You'll notice these are all incantations regarding rejuvenation and vitality, very fitting for the Age of Plenty. And the in-game files seem to name this sigil, the sigil used on these spells, as the Ancient Earth Tree. And given the Crucible incantations use the same sigil, I do think Tarnished Archaeologist is justified in grouping the Age of Plenty and Age of the Crucible together under this umbrella term, Ancient Earth Tree. The Age of Plenty is described in multiple sources, such as the Blessed Dew Talisman and the Icon Shield. This was an age in which Bounty, a Blessed Dew, dripped from the boughs of the tree itself, an age where Godfrey was the Elden Lord, going by the description of the Amber Medallions, which emphasise such amber as an important treasure of his reign. Tarnished Archaeologist argues 
that the Earth Tree has already been burnt before we even reach Leyendale. The main archaeological evidence that they look to is the blanket of ash that already covers Leyendale when we first arrive here, even reaching the heights of Marika's bedchamber. The most obvious source of this ash is undoubtedly the Erd Tree, not only because Leyendale lies in the shadow of the Erd Tree, but because we can see this process being repeated when we ourselves burn the Erd Tree and bury all of Leyendale in a fresh blanket of ash. And therefore it does seem hard to argue that the ash in Leyendale is from the Erd Tree, meaning that the Erd Tree has been burnt before. Cycles, flow and stagnation, all concepts familiar to fans of the Soul series, and a concept tarnished archaeologist suggests is still relevant to Elden Ring in regards to the Erd Tree and its regeneration. To this end, let us look more closely at the wording of the Blessed Dew Talisman, which reads, It was once thought that the blessed sap of the Erd Tree would drip from its boughs forever. But that age of plenty swiftly came to a close, and with time, the Erd Tree became more an object of faith. To this, tarnished archaeologists asked the insightful question, how did the tree change from a functional tree with real bounty to nothing more than a symbol, an idol of worship? How do we reconcile the more arboreal depictions of the crucible with the golden tree that we see before us? How do we compare the more natural looking tree in some depictions with the Celtic knot version of the Erd Tree depicted on Erd Tree incantations and Knights of the Erd Tree? To tarnished archaeologists, the answer is this. There was an original Erd Tree, a real tree, in this age of plenty that actually had a bounty, but it was burned to the ground and ultimately was replaced by a phantom tree that we see before us. And indeed there is further evidence that the Erd Tree was once a wooden real arboreal tree. For example, there is the Great Club, which is said to be made from a Erd Tree branch, yet it is wooden, it is not like the golden phantom that exists before us. There is also the helm of the Tree Sentinel, the defenders of the Erd Tree, and yet their helmet bears a horsehair crest in the shape of a tree that is very natural looking and looks nothing, absolutely nothing, like the phantom tree that now stands before us. There is also the staff of the Erd Tree avatars, the description of which says that it represents the Erd Tree in its former radiance. Again, the tree shown here is very natural looking, very different from the current golden Erd Tree. The examples go on such as the reliefs of a natural tree found in the shields of the statues of tree sentinels at the Grand Lifts, and reliefs found on the bases of statues and at the entrance to the Queen's Bedchamber and the Grand Lift of Dectus. Long have people argued about the nature of the inner wooden tree and the outer golden phantom of the Erd Tree, trying to discern if these are two separate trees. In tarnished archaeologists' mind, these are both the Erd Tree, the wooden stump of the original bountiful Erd Tree and its phantom replacement, grafted onto it through the power of the Elden Ring. And indeed, we too replace the golden Erd Tree that we burn to the ground should we choose the Elden Lord endings. When we repair the Elden Ring and we use one of three mending runes, the destroyed phantom Erd Tree is replaced with a brand spanking new one, and its colour is reflective of the mending rune that we have put into the Elden Ring, showing that this phantom tree really is a reflection of the Elden Ring. And so tarnished archaeologists suggest that this has at least happened once, and maybe more. That the original wooden Erd tree that grew as a result of the Crucible era was burned to the ground, and that is why the Age of Plenty came swiftly to a close, and why the Blessed Dew and the bounty that came from the Erd tree came to an end, because it isn't a real tree anymore, and thus the bounty can only now be found at its offspring, the minor Erd trees. This is a pretty incredible theory, and I highly recommend you check out Tarnished Archaeologist's video, Creeds of the Erd Tree, for a more in-depth look at what I've just talked about. But with these concepts in mind, 
the rise of a new Empyrean could make sense. A candidate intended for godhood to lead the world into a new era, and perhaps we can tie it in to the end of this age of plenty. Or even if you don't believe it was then, maybe now we can acknowledge there were other times within the Erdtree era where the age could have and should have come to a close, with Marika being replaced by a new god. There are some pieces of evidence that could point to the godskin apostasy taking place at the end of the Age of Plenty in this ancient Erdtree era. Firstly, many believe that Melina is the Glomide Queen, and should you summon her in the fight with Morgoth, her casting sigil is this sigil of the ancient Erdtree or Crucible era, suggesting she could be dated back to this time period. There is also the reference to the Crucible in the Godskin Noble's robe item description, and while it may be a thematic parallel, it could be hinting at the fact that the Crucible had some effect on the Noble's inhuman aspects, possibly suggesting they are products of this time as well. But most notably, the Black Blade incantation, Malekith's signature incantation, has the same ancient Erdtree sigil on its item icon. While all of this is circumstantial and speculation, it still makes sense from common sense. As we have already acknowledged, Rani doesn't mention the Glomide Queen as one of the Empyreans in her generation. The fact she doesn't even mention the Glomide Queen suggests that the Glomide Queen was an Empyrean and was active a long time ago. Also, there are too many other events that happen later on in the timeline, such as the Night of the Black Knives, and it would therefore make sense that the Godskin Apostasy something that definitely preceded the Night of the Black Knives, would come early on in Queen Marika's reign. And given the Ash and Leyendel, we know there are other burnings of the Erdtree. But what events were these linked to? Could it possibly be the rise of a new Empyrean who wielded the power of death and death in the form of a flame? We will talk more about these ideas later on in the video. But to conclude, I think there's enough circumstantial evidence that shows A, the Erd Tree was burned before, B, there have been multiple eras under Marika's rule, and C, it most likely meant that the Glomide Queen came early on in the timeline and was likely a challenge at the twilight of the Age of Plenty. But of course, I leave it to you to decide where you think this event sat in the timeline, and I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. But with that said, let us now examine the Glomide Queen and her potential identity. Before we jump into this next chapter, I want to acknowledge a great video by content creator Last Protagonist, as their video on the Glomide Queen has been instrumental in my fundamental ideas on the subject. And so, while I will reference them directly at certain points, I wanted to acknowledge their influence in a general sense. The identity of the Glomide Queen has always been somewhat of a mystery, and so with that said, let us unpack some of these possibilities. I'd like to start by examining the very nature of the Glomide Queen herself and what she perhaps represents. Glom is defined as the following according to Collins Dictionary. Twilight, or the darker part of twilight. And it is ultimately synonymous with dusk, and so the removal of the one instance of a dusk-eyed queen in one of the patches doesn't really hold a huge significance. However, what does hold significance is the already existing connection between Dusk and Death. For example, in the ending that relates to those who live in Death and Godwin, is called the Age of the Duskborn. This of course makes sense having a symbolic tie to the Glomide Queen, given that she was once connected and channeled the power of the Rune of Death, which is ultimately the artifact responsible for the creation of the Prince of Death and those who live in death. The connection between dusk or gloom and death, in a metaphorical sense, is pretty easy to understand. Dusk is the end of the day, and death is the end of one's life. They are both the twilight of something. Indeed, the term gloom-eyed could just be a reference to her purpose, to bring death to Marika and her god kin, heralding the twilight of the age of the gods. And in a way, if we consider the time in which we are suggesting 
her rise took place, the Age of Plenty, the Glomide Queen's domain is very much an inversion of this. The Age of Plenty, the Age of Crucible, is essentially an age of vitality and abundance, an age of life unrestrained. Whereas the Glomide Queen, the representative of the Black Flame and Destined Death, brought death, the complete mirror of the age of life and abundance. A great observation about this thematic inversion was made by content creator Quelag on Twitter, who said the following, Inea refers to the Rune of Death and Death as the Shadow of the Golden Order. The Rune of Death goes by two names, the other is Death and Death. The Forbidden Shadow plucked from the Golden Order upon its creation, which makes sense as it's inverted from Marika's crucifix. I think this is a really powerful observation by Quilag here, that the Glomide Queen's Rune very much represented an inversion to Marika the literal shadow to her rule, and as Quelag points out, it does look like an inversion of Marika's rune. Indeed, it is possible that Marika's original rune is a rune of life, and therefore the rune of death would be the literal shadow to Marika's rune. The reasoning for this potential speculation comes from a tweet by content creator Sekiro Dubi, who tweeted about an item description found in version 1 of the game. In this version of the game, the Icon Shield, a shield that depicts the Age of Plenty, mentions a Rune of Life. Whilst of course this is cut content and shouldn't necessarily be considered canon, it does for me make more sense to Quelag's idea of the Rune of Death literally being an inversion or shadow to Queen Marika's rule, potentially the Rune of Life. And the Rune of Life would make sense for Marika given that the Erd Tree is the nexus of life in the lands between, especially in the Age of Plenty. Whoever the Glomide Queen was, it is clear that her power, the power of the Black Flame that is used by her and her apostles, was channeled by her signature weapon, the Godslayer Greatsword, the description of which reads the following. The Black Flames wielded by the apostles are channeled from this sword. This suggests that the flames themselves, even the ones wielded by the apostles and the nobles, are directly channeled from the rune of death by this sword. It is a medium between the two, really highlighting the importance of this weapon to the godskin movement. Last protagonist makes some very interesting observation in regards to the sword, highlighting its double helix structure that is not dissimilar from the sacred relic sword a weapon made from the body of a god. Perhaps this sword itself was made by a similar process, and we know the Nox have experience in making weapons from corpses like the Finger Slayer Blade. Despite the nightmarish concept of making a person into a sword, we know that such swords do hold important power. For example, the Finger Slayer Blade seems to be the only blade capable of harming a two fingers. Therefore, it is fairly logical to assume that given its double helix DNA-esque shape, that the Godslayer Blade could also be one that was made from a corpse for a special purpose, the purpose of channeling the power of the Rune of Death. In his Glomide Queen video, Last Protagonist does even suggest a theory that it could be possible that the sword is the Glomide Queen herself, that she was the one who is able to channel the Black Flame, and thus the sword is able to and following her defeat, she was turned into a sword, suffering a similar fate to Marika and Radigan as a punishment upon her defeat. Another fascinating detail about the Godslayer Greatsword is that it exactly matches the shape of the Rune of Death. If you turn it point facing down, you can see with its downward facing hilt that it perhaps takes the shape of the Rune of Death, and this could be used as an argument to say that the sword was indeed once the Glomide Queen, that it takes the shape of the Rune of Death because of her relation to this rune. However, I am more of a mind that this is a purpose-built sword for the Glomide Queen, due to the fact that it is a highly detailed sword. Both the Sacred Relic Sword and the Finger Slayer Blade are more primal in their aspect, whereas the entire design of the Godslayer Greatsword does seem to suggest that it was purpose-made. 
hence why its design is so highly detailed. The sword is being designed to evoke the idea of the Rune of Death itself, the pivotal artifact to the Glomide Queen's power and the movement of the Godskins, and I think the idea that it represents the Rune of Death is better captured by this fan-made footage by Eugenia that portrays the Glomide Queen standing victorious over a fallen god, bringing its point down on her foe, the Rune of Death hanging over the heads of the gods. Not only does it seem to have been forged in the very shape of the Rune of Death, but it also seems to display a swirling flame. It's not really a double helix, to me it looks like a flame going upwards, no doubt evoking the very black flame it is used to channel. And to me it also seems designed specifically to channel the flame, again human made, due to the gap in its centre from which the black flame will emerge. However, I do leave the matter of the sword up to you to decide, whether it is a sword made from a corpse, if it's the Glomide Queen herself, or if it was designed with the specifics of the Glomide Queen's requirements in mind. With that said, let us return to the matter of the Glomide Queen's identity. Now, I have heard many people make the argument that they have to be related to Marika, and if we consider the other existing Imperians that we know of, this does make some sort of sense. Melania and Mekla are direct offsprings of Marika, and depending on your viewpoint, Rani is the daughter of Marika's other personality, or at the very least, is Marika's stepdaughter. However, we have to remember that at one stage, Marika herself was chosen as an Empyrean, and so we aren't sure 100% on the situation surrounding her election to godhood, and so we can't be certain in nailing down the prerequisites of Empyrean status. Yet if I was to go out on a limb, I would say that Empyrean status can be a combination of both blood relation and or potential. With that said, I can't help but think the Glomide Queen would thematically fit within the Eternal Cities, being related to the Numen, Marika's kin. Whether she is directly related to the Queen or not, of course we will look at that potential later. The connections between the Nox, the Numen, and the Queen Marika herself are well known to the community at this stage, with the Black Knife Assassin armour telling us the assassins are Numen and kin to Marika, whilst Rogier also refers to them as scions of the Eternal City. And in general, for a history of the Nox, I would recommend both my video on the Eternal Cities and Tarnished Archaeologist's video on the Eternal Empire for two different accounts on the history of the Eternal Cities and the Nox. But whatever you believe about the Eternal Cities and the Nox, it is clear that this is a divergent Numen society that very much opposed the Greater Will as the armour set for the Nox reads the following. Long ago, the Nox invoked the ire of the Greater Will, and were banished deep underground. Now they live under a false sky, in eternal anticipation of their liege, of the coming age of stars, and their lord of night. So it is clear that these are a people who have acted directly against the Greater Will, leading to their banishment underground. However, as I have already argued, the Godskin apostasy isn't really an attack against the Greater Will, and is more against Marika herself, and it falls within the natural cycles overseen by the Greater Will. However, this is not to say that the Glomide Queen could not have come from these people, either before or after their banishment, and if it did come after when they were known as the Nox, one cannot help but think they would still get a great joy with laying Marika low and bringing an end to her Age of Plenty. So when looking at the possible connections to the Eternal City, I'd like to look at one of my favourite lore items in the game, the Godskin Swaddling Cloth, and this item reads the following. Sacred Cloth of the Godskin Apostles, made from supple skin sewn together. The Glomide Queen cradles newborn apostles swaddled in this cloth. Soon they will grow to become the death of the gods. This has always been a striking image to me, of the Glomide Queen cradling newborn apostles, a scene that Eugenia has incredibly brought to life for this video. From the moment they are born, they are cradled by the Glomide Queen, and this makes it abundantly clear 
that the Godskins are not regular humans, nor are they recruited. Not only that, but it says that soon they will grow to become the death of the gods, and to me this has always suggested some kind of accelerated growth, and combined that they are apostles from their very birth leads me to conclude that they are artificial life forms, raised up by the Glomide Queen herself. There is of course a people who are very familiar with creating an artificial life form, the Eternal Cities, and we have discussed this many times on the channel before, but for the sake of this video let us again look at the creations of the Nox when we're trying to discuss the connections to the Godskins. One of the most obvious examples of the Eternal City tampering with life is the Dragonkin soldiers, who we can learn of via the Frozen Lightning Incantation which reads, The Dragonkin were born in the Eternal City, where they knew no true sky nor true lightning, and via the Dragon Scale Blade which reads, Alas the Dragonkin soldiers never attained immortality, and perished as decrepit pale imitations of their skyborn kin. While crude, these tortured failures are evidence of the Eternal's proclivity for tampering with life, and if we consider the Noxian interest in alchemy, then the sky's the limit. When we talk of alchemy, we can of course refer to the Celestial Dew, a fate-altering tonic, and the Puppet Draft, again a tonic which manipulates fate to leverage control over living beings. This alchemical manipulation could have potentially ended up in the creation of the Silver Tears. In a cut quest which has been recreated by Nulrin, there was a Silver Tear by the name of Asimi who we could dialogue with. We would essentially take this Asimi into our body so she could begin to copy our form, whilst apparently granting us power. If we came to the Eternal Cities, Asimi would name this her home. Then, while at the Eternal Cities, she would mention that there is a chalice nearby, the cradle of her kind. The Silver Tears are liquid in nature, and of course a chalice contains liquid, and to me it suggests that the Silver Tears were born of alchemical manipulation by the Nox, and given their purpose, they can mimic the form of other creatures, we could speculate that these beings were created so they could mimic the form of a Lord of Night. And although this is cut content, the presence of the Silver Tears all over the Eternal Cities for me implies that this is still the implication, that the Silver Tears were created by the Eternal Cities, and this is why we actually see Silver Tears fighting alongside the Nox. The Albanorics are also potentially tied as creations of the Nox via a cut dialogue from Tops who would have directly named them as creations of the Eternal Cities, and given the Nox's predilection for manipulating life, again the Albanorcs could well have been a creation of theirs to try and create an artificial Lord of Night, although again that is just speculation. But in general there is a lot of evidence pointing to the Nox and the Eternal Cities as the birthplace of many forms of artificial life. So with that in mind, let us look at the actual physiology of the godskins themselves. They are pale skinned like malleable clay, much like the Albanorix and Silver Tears, and all of the godskins look identical in appearance, like clones. Also, like the Silver Tears and the Silver Weapons of the Nox, the godskin apostles are malleable, able to stretch out and contort in unusual manners again just reinforcing the fact that these are not natural beings. There is of course the lore of the Swaddling Cloth that we have already looked at, suggesting that the Glomide Queen rears every single one from birth, and I hope that even if you don't agree with the Eternal City connection, that we can all agree that these are not natural beings. These are not just humans who have been recruited into a movement. There is also another potential connection between the Godskin Apostles and the Eternal Cities, and this is the death of E.G. And this is something I've talked about in other videos, but upon the completion of Rani's questline, her vassals are assaulted by Black Knife Assassins. Both E.G. and Blythe have the corpses of Black Knife Assassins surrounding them, 
And yet, curiously, E.G. is also burning in the black flame, not the red flame of death and death, but the black god-slaying flame of the godskins. Now, some have argued that this may be a mistake and it was meant to be the red flame, yet I feel this would have been corrected in a patch if it was, like the Dusk Eyed Queen being removed from the God Slayer Greatsword in a patch. So what does this actually mean? Well, if they are both connected to the Eternal Cities, then perhaps it is a hit squad, organised by the Eternal Cities. Reasonings for this assault is something I've gone over in more detail in my Knight of the Black Knives video, but in short, I feel like Rani left the Black Knife assassins high and dry, and we even find Electo, the leader, imprisoned in Rani's Everjail up on Moonlight Altar. So Ichi's death is a curious one, but if the Godskins are creations of the Eternal Cities, then this hit, a combined force of Black Knife assassins and the Godskins, could well make sense. Aside from the creation of the Godskins potentially being linked to the Eternal City, there are some other possible loose allusions that could be used to connect the Glomad Queen herself to the Eternal City culture. One of these is the fact that I have long believed that the Eternal City race is a matriarchal one. Firstly, among the Nox there are the Night Maidens, who appear to occupy a preeminent position in society, with their set making it clear they are important enough to have swordstress bodyguards. There is also the fact that Queen Marika herself, who rose to become the god of the current era, came from this society, and her preeminence could suggest a matriarchal nature to the Numen people. But aside from that, there is also the idea that the moon, an important facet of Nox society, is more associated with the feminine. Rani and Renala, the two most important lunar figures in the game, are women as well, and it is a long-standing concept within Souls games that women are associated with the moon, again if we consider Gwendolyn from Dark Souls, who was raised as a woman because of his strong affinity to the moon. As we discussed in my Rani lore video, this concept could be tied in to the philosophy of yin and yang, where yin can mean the moon and represents the feminine, forming one half of a system of balance. So it isn't hard to conclude that Noxian society is most likely matriarchal because of the preeminence of the moon, and if the moon is more connected to the feminine, this is why it's matriarchal. So it isn't hard to believe that the Glomai Queen could have once been a queen of Numen or Noxian tradition, a once queen of the Eternal Cities. This is all speculation ultimately, but I do find it fairly compelling, especially when we consider the artificial nature of the godskins themselves. And so to conclude, I do speculate that the Glomide Queen comes from the same stock as Marika, whether she be directly related to her or not, and whether that means she was a Nox, a Numen, or another distant relation or offshoot. There is one other interesting concept I would like to talk about before we begin naming a specific candidate, and that is the potential tie of serpents to the Glomide Queen. This was an idea first brought to my attention by a viewer who commented on one of my community posts. The Epic H88 stated that they believe the Glomide Queen was a serpent. This set my mind racing, and shout out to Epic H88 for getting me to pick up this connection and also credit to Tarnished Archaeologist Serpent and the Erd Tree video, which only further compounded my own ideas on this subject. So when talking about the Serpent's Plaith within the Elden Ring mythos, a good place to start is the Duelist set, which reads the following. The snake is viewed as a traitor to the Erd Tree, and the audience delighted in seeing those bronze effigies beaten and battered. The snake was very much the focus of gladiatorial combat, and in essence the crowd wanted to see these snakes beaten down into the dirt. And not only did it feature on the limited armour of the duelists, these gladiators, but there is also the coil shield, a snake shield that was designed for gladiatorial combat, again, a medium through which the people of the Erd Tree society could see the serpent getting what it deserved. Now we do need to ask the question, why is the snake so hated even at this time? 
because we know that gladiatorial combat is a practice dating back to the time of Godfrey, given his warrior aesthetic, his lion rampart being present in the entrances to the Colosseum, and the fact that this practice had died out by the time of Radigan, as told to us by the ritual sword talisman. So surely this is far before Rikard would become the Serpent of Blasphemy and bring his blasphemous war against the Erd Tree in the time of the Shattering and beyond. Indeed, if we look at the Serpent Hunter Spear, it gives us some interesting considerations, as it reads, thought to have been used to hunt an immortal great serpent in the distant past. It manifests a long blade of light when facing such a creature. Used to hunt an immortal great serpent in the distant past, meaning that there was a serpent crisis in the past before Rikard became the Serpent of Blasphemy. And this event would be so dire and so impactful upon society that the people of the Erdtree realm would make it a nemesis in gladiatorial combat and we take delight in it being defeated in these mock battles. I'd always just assumed that the serpent was viewed as an enemy because Igle must have always been in opposition to the Erdtree. And for those unaware, the reason I refer to Igle as the Great Serpent is because of the Temple of Igle at Volcano Manor, which is a temple dedicated to the serpent, and thus we must assume that the name of this serpent is Igle. Now, returning to that original comment by the Epic H88, while I don't necessarily agree that the Glomai Queen herself is a serpent, it has always been interesting to me that the Godskin nobles have serpentine tails, and perhaps this suggests a sort of alliance between the Glomai Queen and the Great Serpent. To me, the description of the gladiatorial set gives me biblical vibes. The serpent thematically has always been seen as the enemy to the Earth Tree, much as the serpent is always seen as metaphorical for evil in the Bible. In the Garden of Eden, it is the snake that tempted Eve to take the forbidden fruit of knowledge, and in this case was the literal mouthpiece for Satan himself. Thus, through the serpent, the original sin is committed, and God's perfect creation is tainted. Indeed, as highlighted by Tarnish Archaeologist's tremendous video, the image of the serpent in the tree in the Garden of Eden is too similar to the imagery on the drawing room key of Volcano Manor, which for those unaware shows a serpent coiled round a tree in this case representative of the serpent's desire to consume and destroy the Erd Tree. Could it be that, like in the Bible, it was a serpent that first whispered in the ear of the Glomai Queen and set her on her path? Could it have then aligned itself with her in her cause, helping her imbue the power of the serpent within her godskin children, which is why the godskin nobles have a serpentine tail, and why the Godskin Apostles are able to stretch and contort like a serpent. Does this also explain why a Godskin Noble has now aligned itself with Rikard and the Serpent of Blasphemy? Is this an old alliance rekindled, so it can assist in creating a new Serpentine Warrior class, so that Rikard and his Serpent Children can succeed where the Godskins failed? Perhaps. This is all speculation, of course but I have always wondered what this ancient enmity against the serpent is, and at the very least, we have the tales of the godskin nobles to consider. These are ultimately serpentine tales, and we find a godskin noble in the hotbed of a serpentine revolution. And perhaps the reason the serpent is so hated is because it assisted the Glomide Queen and her apostles, and its union with Rikard is just the latest in its attempts to overthrow and hurt the Erd Tree. And if you want a deeper look at the serpent and its potential history of opposing the Erd Tree, I would thoroughly recommend Tarnish Archaeologist's video, Serpent and the Erd Tree. So what am I saying about the Glomide Queen up to this point? Well, let me surmise. I believe that she was a queen of the same people as Queen Marika, potentially related to her. And I believe that she was chosen as an Imperian the Imperian's rune was an inversion of Marika's, and she was the shadow of death to Marika's world of life. 
To channel her power, the Glomad Queen had her signature sword forged, and would create an artificial life form specifically designed not only to wield this flame, but to bring death to the gods. In addition, it is possible that there was an alliance between the Glomide Queen and the Great Serpent, cementing the Serpents as an immortal enemy of the Erdtree. There is one other matter regarding the Glomide Queen's allies that we should talk about, and that is the issue of her shadow. As Rani states, each Imperian is granted a shadow, tailor-made to serve them. Rani had Blythe, and Marika had Malekith, and given the Glomide Queen was eventually defeated by the shadow of her opponent, it certainly would have been useful to have one. We know from Vargram's Raging Wolf set that he seeks to become such a shadow, and given his possession of the Godslaying Great Sword, it is clear that he seeks to become the shadow of the Glomide Queen. However, given he is seeking to become one, it suggests that he failed in his quest, meaning he wasn't her actual shadow. The most obvious explanation is that we simply don't know who her shadow was, that the shadow was killed in the conflict of the Godskins, or met some unknown fate that we don't know about. When it comes to the actual identity of the Glomide Queen, who do I believe it is? I have already presented some interesting theories, that she was a serpent, that she was the Godslaying Greatsword herself, or merely an unnamed member of Numen or Nox society. However, if I was to put money on it now, I'm going to be rather boring and say that I do believe that Melina is the most likely candidate for the Glomide Queen, Occam's Razor after all. And when we do see her at the end of the Frenzied Flame ending, with her Glom Eye, it is very compelling, but let's go into another few connections as to why Melina might well be the Glomide Queen. Firstly, as we have stressed throughout this chapter, we do think it thematically fits that the Glomide Queen would be tied to Numen, Nox, and Eternal City society. And Melina would also seem to tick these boxes of being related to this Numen people. First of all, the Black Knife assassins who themselves are described as Numen and kin to Marika, use a technique that is also shared by Melina. We see this blade craft when we summon her in our fight with Morgoth. And if Melina was trained in the same combat techniques as other Numen women, it would suggest that Melina is also of this culture. Melina also refers to her mother within the Erd Tree. Me, I'm searching for my purpose, given to me by my mother inside the Erd Tree, long ago. And what is inside the Erd Tree? It's of course Marika. And again, the Glomide Queen, an Imperian, being the daughter of Marika would fit in with everything else we know about other Imperians who are also of royal blood. For me, one of the stronger arguments for Melina being the Glomide Queen is how familiar she is with Death and Death, which would certainly make sense if she had been the Glomide Queen at one point, a being who literally represented the Rune of Death. Indeed, we will return to this subject in the later chapters on the Godskins, but the fact that Melina is so familiar and understands such a nebulous concept as death and death, and knows that it is required to burn the Erd Tree, is very compelling evidence for me that she was once the wielder of death and death. And then, as mentioned, the real nail in the coffin for many people is the finale of the Frenzied Flame ending, when Melina appears with her Gloam Eye, an eye that was previously sealed, and she once again talks about death and death. And again, the colour of the eye is so particular, to me it does seem to be a wink to the camera, a wink to the audience, that Melina was actually the Glomide Queen, and she kept this part of her identity secret from us. So let me present my speculative analysis of Melina's past identity as the Glomide Queen. She first of all claims that she is burned and bodiless, and is ultimately a bit confused as to why she is still here. Me? I'm searching for my purpose, given to me by my mother inside the Erd Tree, long ago, for the reason that I yet live, burned and bodiless. Indeed, we do see burn scars all over Melina's hands, suggesting that in her corporeal life, 
she was burned, and we know that the Rune of Death manifests its power as a flame, whether that be the black and white flame of the Godskins, or the red and black flame wielded by Malekith. Would it not be a fitting punishment for the Glomide Queen to be burned in the flames of death by Malekith, and given that Malekith wields the power of death and death within his blade, it isn't a stretch to believe that the Glomide Queen burned to death. In addition, Melina's eye is sealed, and it is only unsealed at the ending of the Frenzied Flame. Why? Well, consider the chain of events that happens up to that point. In other playthroughs, Melina dies before Death and Death, or the Rune of Death, is unsealed by the Tarnished. She sacrifices herself in the Flame of Ruin, and then we later defeat Malekith and unbind the Rune of Death. However, in the Frenzied Flame ending, Melina does survive right to the end, so she survives to the point where the Rune of Death has been once again unsealed and is unleashed in the world. And now, Melina's eye is open. I believe it is sealed and unsealed, much like the Rune of Death, that it is literally connected to the power of Death and Death. This is the manifestation of the Rune of Death within her body, and so when it was sealed, her eye was sealed. When it is unleashed, her eye is open. As an aside, as for the tattoo on Melina's sealed eye, I don't have any more specific insight that anyone else has not already said. I do believe that these are talons, and they are representative of death, an allusion to the crow or raven-like deathbirds, no doubt. But talking about Melina's eye, there is another tie that could suggest that again could make her out to be the Glomide Queen. Garank is the alter ego or secret identity of Malekith, but this is after he has sealed Death and Death, the Rune of Death, within his actual body. In time, it becomes part of him, and so he hungers for Death Root. This is a yearning from the Rune of Death itself, who wants its forgotten fragments to be returned to it. As the Death Root item description does make it clear that the Death Root is the form that the Rune of Death takes spreading throughout the Lands Between, following Godwin's murder. And so Garank gives us a tool to be able to track down these fragments. The Beast Eye. This stone talisman that takes the form of the eye has a violet iris that looks almost identical to the hue of Melina at the end of the Frenzied Flame ending. I have no doubt that this particular eye, with its purple hue, is meant to invoke the image of the Gloam-Eyed Queen, and thus is somehow able to connect with the power of the Rune of Death. And given it looks so starkly like Melina's eye, this is another solid bit of evidence that Melina is the Gloam-Eyed Queen. Returning to the concept of her being burned and bodiless, there is one other character who is in a similar position, Rani, who no longer has her body. Both Melina and Rani are able to disappear in a puff of blue sparkles, an observation made by Xylestorm in his video on Melina. This suggests that they are in a similar state, and indeed we know that Rani slew her own body, an event we know of thanks to her own speeches and the description of the curse mark of death. Rani's bodiless state came about through the manipulation of the Rune of Death, and indeed her true body also looks burned. If I am right about Melina being burned in Malekith's flame after her defeat, then perhaps she too was only killed in body, as a punishment, or so Marika could later burn her erstwhile daughter to her will. Or perhaps Marika simply couldn't bring herself to have Melina killed fully, and thus took a half measure by having her rendered bodiless. This is all my speculation, of course, but this is how I see Melina, the once glomied queen was defeated by Malekith and burned in his red flames of death, but denied true death, being killed in body only. Now Marika is in a dire situation, imprisoned within the Ur Tree, unable to take actions herself. So she calls upon her last resort, resurrecting the spirit of Melina, the disembodied spirit of her old enemy and daughter, and Marika directs Melina to help the tarnished, to help bring this age to a close. Perhaps it is Marika who even encourages Melina to once again unleash Death and Death, though Melina makes it clear that no matter her mother's plan, 
Melina has decided that once again, the world needs death. Me? I'm searching for my purpose, given to me by my mother inside the Erd Tree, long ago, for the reason that I yet live, burned and bodiless. There is something for which I must apologize. I've acted the Finger Maiden, yet can offer no guidance. I am no maiden. My purpose was long ago lost. I think this is thematically very neat. Marika once denied Des and Death and the Glomide Queen, yet now she is relying on them both to free her from her eternal imprisonment. We will return to Melina and her views on life and her actions near the end of the game in the final chapter of this video, as I do also think they fit neatly within the narrative that I am presenting. With that said, and the Glomide Queen somewhat covered, let us move on to her followers, the Godskin Apostles. We've already discussed the artificial potential origins of the Godskins, but the artificial nature of the Godskins is important for the thematic opposition to the Erd Tree, and we know about this thematic opposition thanks to the greatest lore item in the game, the Albanort Blood Clot, which says the following. Albanorix are life forms made by human hands, thus many believe them to live impure lives, untouched by the Erd Tree's grace. There is an important thematic point made here, that being an artificial life form is seen to be impure by those of the world of grace, because they are not connected to the Erd Tree, which is essentially a nexus of life, potentially recycling life through it via Erd Tree burials and Erd Tree births. And I would recommend Tarnished Archaeologist's video on the life cycles in the Elden Ring if you are interested on that subject. Aside from this potential cycle of life, we have already discussed how the Crucible and the Age of Plenty was a time of unrelenting, vital life energies. Is it therefore not quite fitting that an Empyrean in distinct opposition to this system, an Empyrean of Death, would wield artificial beings, a thematic parallel to the system of life which they oppose. Regardless, it is a fascinating image to imagine these infant beings being swaddled in godskin cloth by the Glomide Queen herself, and indeed this concept is the focus of Eugenia's work that they did for this video. These beings are raised for a single purpose, and we do see that when we fight them in game. They are ferocious opponents and arguably one of the most powerful life forms that we will face in the lands between, and so it's hard not to see that this is an army raised for a single purpose, to destroy the world of men, I mean to destroy the world of the gods. Yet they aren't just physically impressive combatants, it also seems as though the queen herself imbues them with the power of the Black Flame, for the Black Flame protection incantation reads the following. The apostles were all embraced by the Glomide Queen, and the Black Flame was their armour within. To me this suggests that as part of the Queen's raising of these children was to imbue them with the power of her Black Flame, literally embracing them and putting its power within them. It would become part of their very being, their armour from within. This of course all makes more sense if they are artificial beings raised for a singular purpose to wield the Black Flame and be its vessel, and we can literally see these beings wreathed in its flame in their second stages of their fight, indeed suggesting that the Black Flame is made to be part of them from a very early age. There is of course further evidence that could suggest that the Godskins are literally one with the Black Flame. Firstly, most of the Godskins we face in game seem to appear out of thin air. Their arrival is heralded by the Godslayer Sigil, as if it is an incantation, and then they appear wreathed in black flame. This becomes even more apparent when we face the Godskin duo. When we fell one of them, the other is able to bring back their fallen comrade using some kind of incantation that again is marked by the Godslayer Sigil. The implication is clear to me. The Godskins are more than flesh. They are intrinsically linked to the Black Flame, and again, it makes me think back to the description of Black Flame's protection. 
and how the Black Flame became part of the Godskins when they are embraced by their Gloam-Eyed Queen. All of this together, the fact that they are braised from birth by the Gloam-Eyed Queen herself, that they are able to stretch and contort, that they are incredible fighters, and the fact they wield the Black Flame of Death as if it is part of their own being, all suggest that they are tailor-made for the Gloam-Eyed Queen's purposes. With that said, these beings do seem to possess some culture, dare I say that, and views in regards to their own hierarchy and role within the world. Firstly, let us consider the fact that they are referred to as the Godskin Apostles. They are robed, almost religious looking figures. Apostle is a religious word, a follower and advocate for a certain religious doctrine, such as the Twelve Apostles of Jesus. The religious nature of this movement is reinforced by the fact there is a Godskin prayer book, and the fact that their powers, the Black Flame incantations, are faith based. This is not a political movement, nor an army in the traditional sense. This is a religious crusade, with the Glomide Queen as their messiah figure, their central figure to their beliefs. This of course makes their skinning of the gods far more terrifying. It isn't just psychological warfare, it is a zealous religious practice, a religion that worships death and views the deaths of the gods as their holy purpose. The Noble Presence incantation describes their actions as a god hunt, and for me, this is their religious crusade. No doubt such a movement would have struck absolute terror into the hearts of the gods. This is a religious doctrine, and as such they couldn't be bartered with or reasoned with, these are beings raised to believe in one single doctrine, and it fascinates me to imagine how the godskins would have been at the height. Would they have had temples? Would they have had shrines? All we see of the godskins now are survivors, scattered to the winds pursuing their own agendas. And so again, this idea of a religious movement is something I think that Eugenia has captured well in her renders. With that said, even within this movement there was a hierarchy, and of course, I am referring to the godskin nobles, who we learn of via the godskin noble set, which reads, Nobles are the most ancient apostles who are said to have assimilated inhuman physiology, not unlike the crucible, the earth tree in its primordial form. So these beings are the most ancient of their kind, and thus are nobles among their kind. And what is interesting is that there does seem to be a sort of classist superiority among these nobles. As the description of the godskin stitcher, their signature weapon, reads the following. The nobles possess skill with the sword, unmatched by any lowborn. Despite its size, successive attacks from this weapon are swifter than the eye can follow. The term lowborn to me suggests that they see regular apostles as lowborn, and combined with them being the most ancient of their kind, perhaps these nobles were born as the first wave, or via a different process. Indeed, they do have inhuman aspects to them. And indeed it does leave us to question whether a special process went into creating these nobles that involved the crucible somehow, but again that is all just speculation. However, admittedly this sword could be referring to humans when it says a lowborn, and that the apostles in general see themselves as something better, something purer. But regardless, these godskin nobles clearly have a high opinion of themselves. And in fact, the noble's robust size could also be interpreted as a noble aesthetic choice, for in days past, in the real world, a large size was often seen as an indicator of wealth and position, as such a privileged lifestyle would manifest in a richer diet, and in general it could be seen as a sign of prosperity, success and nobility. Overall, the picture we get of this sect is that they aren't just mindless automatons, despite being raised for a single purpose. They are a singular people with a single purpose, but they do themselves have their own beliefs and are certainly not above pride. With that said, let us now look at their adornments, weapons, jewellery and associated symbolism. I want to start with one of the most important part of the Godskin aesthetic, and that is the symbol that is cast when Godskins appear, when they use the Black Flame incantations, and the sigil that forms the Godslayer's seal, 
It's obviously important that we look at this, as this is obviously the emblem of their movement. I have long pondered what this image is, given that the other schools of magic or incantations have a symbol important to their associated themes and beliefs. So I went back to basics and asked myself what is most important to the Godskin Apostles, and of course, the answer to that is the Gloam-Eyed Queen. If you were to turn this symbol on its side, it could well look like a very stylized eye, like the Eye of Horus, or the protective eyes find on the Luzu boats of Malta, a practice which dates back to Greek and Phoenician times when warships and boats had protective eyes painted upon them. Likewise, I believe this sigil to be the Eye of the Gloam-Eyed Queen, a very holy object for the godskins, no doubt. One further interesting consideration when we are talking about this sigil is the description of the Godslayer seal, which of course has the sigil on it, and the item description reads, Sacred seal of the Godskin Apostles, inlaid with obsidian, said to represent the manipulation of Black Flame. This catalyst enhances Godslayer incantations. Now, the language here is a little confusing. Does it mean that the seal represents the manipulation of Black Flame in its function, i.e. by using this seal you can manipulate Black Flame? Or does it mean the obsidian inlaid represents the manipulation of Black Flame? Or does the sigil itself represent the manipulation of Black Flame? If it is the latter, you could argue that the sigil of the Godskins isn't an eye at all, but instead some abstract shape that represents the Black Flame being controlled and manipulated. However, even then, you could argue that the Gloam-Eyed Queen is the one who is able to manipulate Black Flame and channel it, and thus her eye does represent control over the Black Flame. Either explanation satisfies me, to be honest, and so make of it what you will. With that said, I would also say that the massive purple gems found on both the Godskin Noble and Apostle sets are also representing the Gloam Eye as well, protective or empowering talismans that have a religious significance to the Godskins. With that covered, let us look more closely at the robes and weapons of the Godskins. Firstly, when looking at the circular pattern in the centre of the Godskin Noble Robe, I would suggest that this is also meant to evoke the Black Flame, as I find this knotted symbol to be very reminiscent of those found on the Godslaying Greatsword, which I also see as representing the swirling black flame. As for the other symbolism found on the Apostles' robes, I would suggest that these are also stylistic representations of death and the Godslaying black flames. These are religious robes, after all, for Apostles, and so it makes sense that it would be inscribed with the image most important to their movement. The noble's robes also have another interesting design choice, as the description for the chess piece for the noble set reads, Worn by godskin nobles, known for their seven face aprons. Myself and others have pondered upon the symbolism of how the number seven is relevant to the movement, and there are no solid answers based on in-game lore, so take the following speculation with a pinch of salt. However, in the real world, the number 7 is an important one in terms of symbolism, a point well made by Reddit user Quirkus23, who commented on a Reddit post about the Godskin Noble set, which I will link below. In this comment, the user highlights that there are 7 days in the week, 7 days of creation in the Bible, and 7 luminaries. With these connections in mind, Quirkus suggests that seven could be seen as transformative, a change-bringing number, much like the seventh day of the week heralds its end. I am unsure how I sit on the seven faces, but this was the most compelling explanation I could find, so take it as you will. And let me know your thoughts below on the seven faces found on the Godskin Noble set. So the descriptions of both the Apostle and Noble robe make it clear they are indeed made from skin and their very name, the Godskin Apostles, would suggest that this is Godskin. In my original Godskin lore video, I did doubt the veracity of this, given it would take the hell of a lot of Godskin to make this amount of robes for all the Apostles and all the Nobles, with at least seven Gods dying for each Noble's robe. 
However, since then, I have been more willing to consider that these could well be made of god skin. Firstly, the text dump of the game describes these as robes made from tanned god hide. Secondly, my view on how many gods there have been has dramatically changed since that first video a year ago. In my Knight of the Black Knives video, we highlighted an article from Bandai Namco that they released in December 2021, and it launched alongside the game's story trailer. In this article, they expanded upon some of the lore explained in the story trailer, and regarding the Knight of the Black Knives, they said this, One grim night in the depths of winter, a flock of unknown assassins stole across the lands between. In a coetaneous attack, this foul covenant snuffed out the lives of many of the God Queen's kin throughout the Empire, too numerous and too scattered for her godly protection to save. The article is really interesting and I will link it below and recommend you give it a read. In particular, I find this passage to be of real interest because it changed my perception on how many of Marika's kin there are and expanded the scope of the gods for me. This quote illustrates a mass slaughter of many of Marika's kin, suggesting that there are far more gods, far more blood relations to the royal family than the main cast of characters in the game, a point reinforced by the soulless demigods found in the mausoleums, more demigods that have been killed whose name we don't know. Oh and by the way, there are seven of these nameless demigods, so do with that as you will in regards to the seven faces found on the Godskin Noble set. Returning to the concept of gods, perhaps the gods could encompass a wide-reaching family tree, offshoots and everyone else that are distantly related to Marika, forming a godly royal family that spread throughout different generations and different branches. So if the Black Knife assassins killed many gods, aside from Godwin himself, who is to say that the godskins did not hunt down countless demigods, who would be skinned and used as material for their iconic robes? However, I do want to caveat this discussion by acknowledging there is at least one instance where a godskin appears to gather human skin, and this is at the village of Dominula, an observation that I made in my first video about a year ago. Dominula is a village in Altus Plateau, where it seems as though the members of said village are having a merry old time, celebrating a festival. We hear of said festival via the set that they wear, the festive set, which reads, Hood worn by dancers at the festivities in Dominula, the village of the windmills. And at first glance, while this may appear to be a merry old time, a quick vibe check will tell us that something isn't quite right here. Firstly, there are no men, only women and they all seem to have a slightly manic aspect to them. Something is a little off here. They're also very well armed for people that are celebrating a festival. And there is one over there, licking a butcher's blade while standing over the corpse of someone. The answer of course comes via a ghost NPC at the entrance to the village, and its dialogue implies that skinning is a constituent part of this festival. and given it is only women left, I presume that it is the men who play the unfortunate victims in this celebration. And lo and behold, right at the top of the village, overseeing this celebration is a godskin apostle, ready to take his tithe of skin. My take now is the same as it was in March last year, that this godskin apostle has manipulated the people of this town to create a skinning festival that is essentially manufactured so it can be a source of fresh skin, whether that be for the godskin's own religious doctrine, or whether they actually need skin, human skin, to make new robes or fix their current ones. Ultimately, one could see this festival as evidence that the skin is human skin that the godskins actually use for their robes, although, like I say, the godskin apostles could just see the skinning of someone as a holy rite, and that is why they're implementing it at this village, rather than for a supply of skins, but take it or leave it, 
I will leave it up to you to decide what's happening at Dominula and why it's happening. Whether it is human skin or god skin that makes their robes, the effect is quite clear. This movement would have struck fear into the hearts of the gods, who no doubt would have imagined their own face adorning the apron of a god skin noble. Yet there is more to it than this. The skinning of your enemy and keeping them as a trophy, or using them as a material for the mundane, is the ultimate domination and humiliation of your opponent. For example, there's the account of the Roman Emperor Valerian, who, according to some accounts, was captured by a Persian king called Shapur, following the Battle of Edessa in 2060 AD. According to a later account given by a writer called Lactantius, Valerian would eventually be flayed alive, with his skin then being stuffed to keep as a trophy, the ultimate humiliation for a once powerful Roman Emperor. Of course, we can't speak to the veracity of these ancient sources, but the message is clear. The skinning of one's enemy, like one would skin an animal, is the ultimate degrading act. You see your opponent as no more than a beast. You would usually use animals for your leather, for your shoes, for your trousers, but instead you're using this person's very identity as your leather for the mundane. This is of course quite significant when we consider the targets of the godskins, the gods. To me their purpose of wearing godskin is to send a message. We do not respect your authority, we do not respect your divinity, you are nothing to us. We will tear down your empire and skin you like beasts and we will wear you like clothing in mockery of your former status and a testament to our mastery over the gods. They are both trophies, part of their creed, but they ultimately serve as a warning and a lesson to the gods. As such, their weapons are essentially both weapons but function as skinning and sewing implements. The godskin peeler wielded by the apostles by its look and description is clearly a skinning implement meant to peel the skin clean off, and the godskin stitcher, the weapon of the nobles, is more like a sewing needle, meant to tailor and pull clothes together. In a way you could see this division of labour as another division between the two classes. The apostles have to get their hands dirty, doing the actual skinning, whereas the nobles get a more refined tool, meant for stitching and sewing. With that said, let us look at the godskin god hunt itself, its ultimate conclusion, and its legacy. The term God Hunt, coined by the Noble Presence incantation, is fitting when we consider the power that the Glomai Queen and her apostles wielded. Let us revisit the description of the scouring Black Flame, which reads, The Black Flame could once slay gods, but when Malekith sealed death and death, the true power of the Black Flame was lost. At this stage, when the scouring flame was first utilised, it could literally slay the gods, and clearly possessed a metaphysical connection to the rune of death that it no longer does. This flame literally channeled the power of the rune of death. But the threat of this flame could have been even more dire, and could have threatened more than just the gods. In a very astute observation, in their Flames of the Gods video, they hypothesised that the Black Flame may have well been the one that was meant to burn the Erd Tree. V Limit highlights a cut dialogue from Enea during the burning of the Erd Tree cutscene that happens in game. However, at one point, there would have been a cut dialogue that mentioned the Black Flame, and I quote that cut dialogue now The Rune of Death is unbound. Black Flames have devoured the Erd Tree, and the lands between are shrouded by Death's dark fate. Tarnished archaeologist builds upon V Limit's premise by highlighting what we do in game to burn down the Erd Tree. We first of all unleash the power of the Flame of Ruin, but it is tempered by death and death. Only together can they burn the Erd Tree. And to quote Tarnished archaeologist directly, what is the Black Flame but a combination of fire and the power of death and death? And if our combination of the Flame of Ruin and Death and Death burns the Erd Tree, then it makes sense that the Black Flame of the Godskins would have been able to do the same. And with this understanding of the Black Flame in mind, 
it is easy to see why the fire monks of the mountaintops would abandon their charge to worship the Black Flame. Monks who had already been bewitched by the power of flame would no doubt have seen the Black Flame as something greater, a fire touched by the power of the Rune of Death. So they hastily dyed their robes and beards and lent their power to the Glomide Queen and the Godskin Apostasy. It is impossible to say how successful this apostasy actually was, but given the sheer amount of tortured faces found in the robes of the Godskins, I would hazard that they killed at least a few and struck fear into the heart of the gods. Marika would fear the threat of the Glomide Queen enough to the point that she would entrust Malekith to deal with this particular threat. It was at this stage I believe that Malekith imbued his sword with the power of death and death, which we learn of via his armour set and the Black Blade incantation, the latter of which has the symbol of tarnished archaeologists ancient Erdtree era, again suggesting that the events of the Godskin apostasy and Malekith's response to it took place in this era. Now we know from the description of the scouring Black Flame that the true power of the Black Flame would eventually be lost with the sealing of Death and Death, and we know from Malekith's remembrance that he would eventually be the vessel for it. In the past, I had thought that Malekith imbuing his sword was the so-called confinement of the Rune of Death, that the very action of imbuing his sword with death and death was the act of sealing it, and that sealing it within his flesh after fragments were stolen on the Night of the Black Knives was just a further precaution. However, thanks to the timelines presented by tarnished archaeologists, I do now acknowledge that Malekith imbuing his sword with death and death is not the same thing as him sealing it, becoming a vessel for it. And in fact, the murder of Godwin and the slaughter of many of Marika's kin is a far more catastrophic event involving death that could have been the motive for sealing death and death. As Garank, Malekith really does have a sole purpose, confining the rune of death, hence why he not only hides it within his own flesh, but also hides his true identity and form. However, at the time of the Godskin apostasy and his battle, with the Glomide Queen, he was a different being. He was Malekith. He was death made manifest. He didn't hide or confine death. He wielded it openly. And this is what really defines Malekith, not confinement like Garank, but the open wielding of death, becoming death itself. And this is why when he unseals it during his fight with us, he reverts to his Malekith form once more. So just to tidy up the timeline a bit, at the time of the Godskin Apostasy, he was Death Incarnate, Malekith. But following the slaughter during the Night of the Black Knives, he became Garank. And this is when Death and Death was truly sealed, and the power of the Black Flame was sapped. This only makes Malekith's achievements against the Glomide Queen more impressive, because he fought them at the full height of their power. He didn't confine the Rune of Death before, he had defeated them, and he fought fire with fire, with his death imbued blade against the black flame of the Godskins. The item descriptions of both the Godskin Apostle Robe and the Godslayer Greatsword imply that it was Malekith who personally defeated the Godskin movement, Queen and all. This implies that he decimated their ranks and personally defeated the Glomide Queen, ending this rival's claim on behalf of his god. His total domination over the Godskins and mastery over death really is well emphasised by the description of Garank's Beast Claw incantation, which reads, Long ago, Garank was a beast of such terrifying ferocity that his former name meant Death of the Demigods. Looking back on it, this incantation and its item description is a hint to the player, before they've met Malekith, that Garank is Malekith. With Malekith's victory, no longer did the Glomide Queen hold the threat of death over the demigods. It was Malekith who became known as such. Marika's henchman, who wielded this power, a not so veiled threat for any of those who would try to defy her rule in such a manner again. And given the power of the godskins that we have discussed, this is no mean achievement. Indeed, his ferocity is backed up by his armour set item description, which reads, Malekith, 
Queen Marika's loyal half-brother, bore a blade imbued with death and death, and there was not one demigod who did not fear him. Malekith's reputation is clearly the result of this victory and his wielding of the Rune of Death. The Godskin Apostle Set tells us that the Black Flame's power was drained, and as we have said this comes much later, after Malekith would become Garank and seal Death and Death, and at that point the scattered remains of the Godskin movement were truly robbed of their last vestiges of power. And yet they haven't given up, as we see they are active in the lands between. And with that said, it is now time to talk about the legacy of the Godskin movement and their gloam eyed queen. So what is the legacy of the Godskins? Well, their low numbers attest to their destruction at the hands of Malekith. And as we have already said, when Malekith would seal death and death within his flesh, the power of the Black Flame would be sapped. And while it is still a dangerous flame attack that we can see when we fight them, it is no more than that. It has lost its connection to death and death. As such, the prospects for the Godskin movement seems dire, and yet they remain formidable, purpose-built killing machines that they are. The placement of the Godskin NPCs throughout the world is a masterful example of environmental storytelling in my opinion, as each of their locations appears to have a story purpose, hinting that the Godskins have not quite given up and still relentlessly pursue their initial aims. There is a Godskin at the base of Caelid Divine Tower, defending their most holy of relics with a Black Monk, the Godslayer Greatsword itself. Perhaps at the defeat of the Glomide Queen, this Godskin Apostle saw it as his duty to take this sacred relic and protect it at all costs. There is of course the Godskin Apostle found at Dominula, who we have already discussed, a figure who has manipulated an entire community to provide his creed with fresh skin. Then there is the Godskin Noble at Liarnia Divine Tower, acting as a barrier between us and Rani's curse mark of death. Perhaps this godskin is here to claim this fragment of the Rune of Death, so they can once again try and imbue their flames with its godslaying properties. Likewise, we can find the menacing godskin duo in Far Missoula, shockingly close to the Rune of Death and Malekith. Their purpose here is quite clear. They are here for the Rune of Death. Perhaps they can sense it. And had they reached Malekith and killed him before us, who knows what may have transpired. Then of course we have the Godskin Noble found in Volcano Manor, and whether or not you agree with the potential deep ties to the Godskins and Serpents, the presence of the Noble here also makes sense in a general sense, as clearly they are allies of convenience. Both Rikard and the Godskins want the same thing, the destruction of the Erd Tree. Thus, both benefit. Rikard gets a powerful ally, who potentially has knowledge of forming artificial life. In return, the Godskin could help Rikard potentially complete what it wanted to do, whilst also having access to plenty of fresh skin. There are plenty of prisoners within Volcano Manor's prison town, and the description of the Albanoric Mask found nearby, as well as Derika's Woe, also found nearby, could imply that the Godskin gets to practice his skinning ways, and the legacy of the Godskins goes beyond the surviving Godskins themselves, as we interestingly find the Godskin prayer book within Stormvale Castle. Godric is desperate to destroy his demigod rivals and return to the land of his blood. It should therefore come as no shock that he would look to the rituals of those who once made god killing their creed. Yet perhaps the Godskin's greatest legacy is the one found littering the streets of Dell, the ash that blankets the capital. We discussed tarnished archaeologists' theory regarding the first burning of the Ur Tree, a traumatic event that brought a bountiful age to a close. The arboreal physical Ur Tree is reduced to a withered stump, through the act of burning that we can later recreate on our path to become Elden Lord. Yet who was responsible for this first burning? A burning which condemned the Erdtree to exist only as a phantom in the eyes of the faithful. 
as tarnished archaeologists suggest in their Serpent and Erd Tree video, the vitriolic hate for the serpent and why it became the focus of gladiatorial games is a mystery and a fascinating one at that. But perhaps it is well earned. Perhaps it is the alliance of Serpent and Gloam that is responsible for the Erd Tree's greatest calamity, and perhaps the Black Flames, a combination of fire and death and death, once stripped the Erd Tree of its former glory. And should Melina be the Gloamide Queen, she is a pale shadow of her former self, her true destructive power sealed behind her eye, as the Rune of Death itself is sealed beneath Malekith's skin. Her final purpose is fitting however, yet the context is different from the Godskin movement. Instead of leading a coup against a god, she has been tasked by that same god to bring an end to suffering, an end to stagnation. And so she does what she knows. She burns. She burns herself, and she burns the Erd Tree, so that you may bring death and death back into the world. Yet Melina isn't a person of unbridled destruction, and her attitudes towards life, to me, serve as one final piece of evidence that she may have been the Glomide Queen, a purveyor of death, not destruction, only bringing death in so that it may balance out the abundance of life. And so, should we choose a different path, the path of the frenzied flame, should Melina abandon us and not sacrifice herself in the flame of ruin, then perhaps the Glomide Queen will once again be unlocked, alongside the Rune of Death that we free from Malekith's flesh. Melina's opposition to the Lord of Chaos shows the true nature to me of the Glomide Queen. She is not a force of evil or destruction, rather she is the natural death that all systems need, a balancing force in a world that has fallen far out of sync. Yet a cog in the machine of order she remains, despite representing death. She does not wish for life to be universally extinguished, rather that the destined death of each individual is administered properly at the end of their life. Indeed, Melina begs the Tarnished to stay away from the path of chaos, from the path of true destruction. However ruined this world has become, however mired in torment and despair, Life endures. Births continue. There is beauty in that. Is there not? If you would become Lord, do not deny this notion. Please, leave the frenzied flame alone. And should we choose such obliteration, such chaos, then perhaps it is the Glomide Queen, the wielder of death and death, who will stand as life's final champion. Lord of frenzied flame, I will seek you as far as you may travel to deliver you what is yours. Destined death. Thank you so much for watching this video. My coverage of Elden Ring began almost a year ago to the day and my coverage began with the Godskins. They were the first bit of lore that truly grabbed me and so I was excited to revisit this subject a year later. While I am immensely proud of that first video, a lot has changed since then, not only with my style, but also my understanding and in general the lore landscape within this community. And so now I find myself with a new perspective on the Glomide Queen and the Godskins, whilst I also remain true to a lot of the ideas I had when I first did that Godskins video. I'd like to once again thank the lore community who have helped push forward our understanding of the lore creators who I often reference throughout my videos because their ideas are so fundamental in shaping some of my own ideas. And so I'd like to offer my thanks to content creators like Loki, Tarnished Archaeologist, Quaylag, Lore Hunter, Crunchy, Vati, V-Limit, Mad Luigi, Ratataskar, Erdin, Xyostorm, and many many more. Our understanding of the lore is in such a different place from when it was when I first did that video. I'd also like to thank Eugenia for bringing this imagining of Godskin culture to life with 3D renders that were commissioned for this video. I've always loved the implication of the description of the Godskin swaddling cloth, and so to have it reimagined by Eugenia is an absolute joy, as well as the other depictions of their creed that we don't see in-game. So I hope you liked this video, 
please leave a comment with your thoughts below and let me know what you'd like me to cover next. But until next time, Tarnished, I will see you in the Godskin Tannery. Take care and have a wonderful night.